This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. Awesome Chat is brought to you by Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast. <laughs> Hey guys, Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here at the uh, Sorgatron Media Studios here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with your awesome chat. The show with uh, where we talk with people in and around uh, Pittsburgh and other awesome things. And actually, we have a lot of people not in Pittsburgh, but uh, uh, we have them on here for other awesome things that they're doing in awesome regions. And today is definitely one of those cases. But of course, of course, you can check out everything at uh, awesomecast.com. You can uh, subscribe, find where to subscribe to this and the regular awesome cast that we do every Tuesday at... 7 p.m. Eastern Time on the Facebook Live and uh, find other ways that you can communicate with us and hit us up at Awesome Chat on our Awesome Cast, I'm sorry, on the Twitter and the Awesome Cast uh, Facebook group where you can have conversations with us and we can talk about the people that we've interviewed and and we've actually actually been sharing a lot of links to the people we've we've been interviewing lately uh, in in advance so you can uh, know what's uh, going on uh, into the, the interview as well. But uh, with us to this week, I am always excited. You know, I, I started this cast as a, hey, look what's happening in Pittsburgh because everybody's looking at the East and West Coast. And I love it when one of the even smaller towns than what Pittsburgh is are doing two cool tech, tech things. With me is one of the great guys I got to meet at Replay FX here recently. Uh, it is uh, Dr. Matthew White of Whitehorn Digital in Erie, Pennsylvania. Hey, how you doing? And you guys are publishing video games. You got it. Yeah, we uh, we just started uh, pretty recently, actually. That's awesome. So uh, we had, as like I said, we had a small conversation about this, and it was just definitely one I wanted to expound uh, upon uh, on this show as well. So, what is Whitehorn Digital? Whitehorn uh, is a uh, it's a video game publisher. I mean, we we by and large we help indies get out the door. Um, there's a lot of publishers out there right now, and some of the big ones you've certainly heard about are like Devolver, Raw Fury, like these kind of bigger guys. They're still very small compared to, you know, your Sony, your massive giants. Mm-hmm. But we like to be kind of an indie publisher ourselves because really, I mean, there's three of us working. We, you know, we're primarily supported by like Patreon, Kickstarter, and tax grants. So we're, we're scraping by. But at the end of the day, we get uh, indies in, usually about five per year. Uh, that have a great game, but really lack um, sort of business acumen, uh, whether that be very standard things like just running QuickBooks, accounting, that kind of deal, getting them a lawyer, uh, helping them negotiate with first party to actually get on platforms. We basically provide business services and marketing and PR to indies at the end of the day, and we do it in exchange for a single-digit revenue share. I think when we were first talking, like the idea that came in my head, I, I, I think I misinterpreted that you were like an indie game incubator of sorts. Is that an accurate? Yeah, we, you kind of no, are no. There's that. Too. There's that too. We have a we have a space in Erie, and uh, we have, as you mentioned, not exactly like a massive video game scene up here, and certainly not a huge population. But we do have uh, four universities. We are blessed with universities. Um, one of which is Penn State. Uh, actually, where I used to work, did the video game program up there. Mm-hmm. And so we have a space downtown in Erie where no commitment, no cost, folks can come in that are indies, that are making something that we're sort of interested in maybe eventually publishing, but they're not uh, kind of there yet. And we have a 24-hour-a-day working space with fiber op and space available for them if they need it, and they're local to the area. So we do have a little uh, area in our offices that we use for that purpose as well. That's kind of um, more for folks who, like I say, are not there yet in terms of their game being a commercial product. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's there's certainly more of those than there are ones that are ready, ready up here right now. Yeah, because I mean, this is especially you probably get a lot of like first time game developers, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah, and um, it's hit or miss. Uh, so we have five games per year. Is generally, like all I can handle because I have a day job as well. It's remote. And, graciously lets me do these things in my free time after work hours. Mm-hmm. So um, certainly the amount I can handle is quite limited when it's, you know, my wife and I in a temp like helping. Um, it's not something that we can devote a huge amount of resources to. So we do try to pick uh, about four or five really solid games every year that are 
it's substantially done and just need that extra little kick in the butt to get out the door and really hit it to the rafters. Um, and many of those people, this is their first game, but not all. Uh, there's a few in there who've made a couple of cracks at the indie um, sort of life and haven't necessarily made enough ROI to actually make it a full-time gig. And we're trying to partner with them and help them make that something that they can actually do for good. Awesome. So you talked about, you know, it's kind of a smaller location up there, right? Um, and, and that's what always kind of surprised me. I'm surprised. First of all, Penn State has a video game curriculum up there? Yeah, actually, hey, I, to plug myself, I wrote it. Um, I was in, <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of it. Yeah. Uh, there's two other, two other professors, too, to their credit, that helped out quite a lot. Um, I was hired uh, out of my PhD. Um, I had contracted for a whole bunch of game companies in the past, and then I, uh, Worked for some indie companies in Atlantic Canada before that opened up, and I interviewed, and they gave me it. God bless them. And Penn State actually has a wonderful IP policy as well, so during that time, I was able to publish more games, and nice. during the summer's contract for AAA entities and travel all over and do that kind of stuff. So it was great. Um, eventually, after that, I moved in, into AAA full-time. I was at Volition for a while on the Saints Row series, and PlayStation after that for a while on a whole bunch of stuff. Um and then eventually just kind of got tired of living in California and came back here. <laughs> you know, a- it's great. It's great. My, uh, my mortgage in the house that you see me in is less than my parking space was in San Diego. So <laughs> that, That's not a joke, actually. That, that's damn No, serious. I believe it. I believe it. I know some people that live in San Diego, and, and just the expectations are definitely on a different level for a guy that I, I think also works in computers. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's a big attraction, right, is to come to like a town like Erie where you can be a little more comfortable and do what you do. Oh, we talk about the long runway, right? So you'll yeah. hear this like a metaphor in entrepreneurship. It refers to like when you're a better pilot, you only need a tiny little runway to take off. But mm-hmm. when you're learning, you need a long one so you don't crash and burn. Right. Literally. So in this case, uh, the runway is how long you can feasibly screw up and not actually make revenue before you end up homeless. Um, <laughs> and in San Francisco or area, that's really short. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, unless you have venture money, the amount you can feasibly save up to afford your $6,000 a month rent is like, I mean, you're in bad shape if you screw up for even a few months. Yeah. Every year at GDC, we sort of make the joke, not joke, that the homeless problem is really quite bad in San Francisco. Yeah. And they're doing a lot to try to help them. But we always say, like, I wonder how many of these folks used to work in a tech company around here. That, because yeah. There's, there's a whole Vice article on this lately. The working homeless. There's a whole group of people that literally work in tech companies that don't have homes. Uh, live in their car, that kind of thing. So, anyway, so the expectation is quite different, as you say. We keep the cost very low and the overhead very low here to allow us to take sort of risks um, that we wouldn't necessarily be able to take in a bigger environment. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people in the games industry, or I should say, a lot of people who are gamers who are not in the games industry, get very salty at like big companies for making kind of the same sort of IP over and over again. Um, but I think that's just a lack of perspective, right? Like a company that operates with 400, 500 employees in the Bay Area, you know, they, they don't really have a lot of flexibility to make a massive risk. No, so no. all things considered, I mean, it, you know, it's your Marvel superhero movies that keep coming out again and again and again. I mean, to some degree... You, sure, you get a little burned out on them, but at the same time, I mean, that company needs to keep making these to stay solvent. Uh, you know, you have shareholders to report to, you you have employees that need to eat. Yeah. So this is a perfect place to take wild and wacky risks. So, you know, we, we try to invest in games that are weird, offbeat, hard to explain, um, just really wild and odd. And for that reason, uh, you know, we take a pretty significant risk on making substantial ROI. But at the same time, there's no giant sword dangling over our heads if we have a few that are like, you know what, this was an art thing that needed to come out, didn't make us a million dollars, but we'll try again. Yeah, we're looking for like one of the, uh, you know, that's why I love indie games is the, is the level of whimsy with a lot of these. We're looking at uh, uh, right now in the video where the bees make honey, for instance, which, uh, yeah. I mean, it seems like a little bit of like elements of what I would, I would say like maybe Fez and, and, and uh, uh, Monument Valley, but, uh, yeah. you know. So Brian Wilson, the developer, just got interviewed recently by GameSpot. We were mm-hmm. on the room Taku for a little while, so we really hit that one out of the park, but mm-hmm. it, he's looks, great. Looks amazing. 
Yeah, so he's he was a visual artist first, was a photographer and sculptor and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so he's very familiar with sort of like the visual art medium, but taking a little longer on the programming side. So we've been working together on that. But his is really interesting. I mean, you're getting snippets of the gameplay there. What we're showing off lately has been the sort of rotational levels, which are, um, yeah, exactly. You're hitting on you're hitting on all the inspirations, Monument Valley, uh, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, that kind of thing. Uh, and yeah, that one is set to be a quarter one 2019 release on all major platforms. It's about a $10 three hour type experience. So we want to set up expectations up front that it's like, this is not a 30 hour game. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not something that you're going to play for 50 hours and hunt achievements in. I mean, it's something that's going to be extremely narrative, extremely introspective, tell a really kind of thoughtful story and look really pretty. I mean, we want every scene in that to be like a print that you could like feasibly put on your wall. Another one that I, I, I'm looking at here um, on, on your YouTube channel, uh, again, we talk about those kind of weird, uh, quirky kind of games. Uh, Beans, the coffee shop simulator, is yeah, another one you have uh, showing off here. That's actually what funded us. So about two years ago, we did a Kickstarter for Beans. We got $5,000. Um, not a ton of money, but it, we didn't put a lot of time into it it's, it, it, it's, it's not as diversely uh it, it's a little more of a pixel game you know yep. a little bit that ape yeah. style so you know so it, yeah the thing about that one is it's uh it's goofy i was yeah. making that while i was at playstation one of the things um one of the things you start to feel in the AAA industry and i'm actually writing a book about this is the more specialized you get in AAA, a the farther you actually get away from making a game so to give you an analogy it's a bit like beer if you really, really love beer and that's been your whole life, you'd be very unsatisfied working at like Anheuser as one person who measures the specific temperature of yeast 15 times a day. Like, but that role is so necessary in a big, big enterprise. Like you need people to be working on barley shipments and checking quality and making sure alcohol levels are up to speed and, you know, doing the health and safety certification, these very specific minute tasks that are so necessary when you get to a certain size. When you're indie, you're doing everything. You're, you're one part PR person, you're one part programmer, you're one part janitor. Like you have so many different roles in a day. Um, so I was making beans in my spare time with my wife and a friend uh, while I was day jobbing at PlayStation. And it was kind of just a test for me of, okay, if I put $5,000 into this thing, if I make even $5,001 back, I'm going to go indie. <laughs> and I did, and I did. <laughs> that was uh, cool. Yeah. But thankfully, at the same time, serendipitously, a wonderful studio called uh, Keywords. They are a big multinational sort of entity that provides middleware services and sort of middle services for the games industry. Um, offered me a remote job doing what I was doing for PlayStation. And they've been really great to work with and really flexible with me doing this stuff on the side. So That's awesome. Uh, so tell us what else is coming out. You know, what have you put out that people can look out for? Uh, and these are these are pretty broadly available too, right? Like you mentioned like, right. that one next year is coming out on all major platforms. And of course, yep. there's a lot of this indie stuff uh, uh, happening uh, on those platforms as well. Yeah, absolutely. So there's five games a year. The entire five cohort for 2018 is full. Um, there are five in there, all of which are available on the website. Um, it's Where the Bees Make Honey, the sort of atmospheric platformer puzzler thing that sort of defies explanation. Uh, that should be quarter one of next year. There's another one called Bomb Fest, which is a four-player local party game. This where have- looked fun when I was passing it on. I unfortunately, didn't, I didn't gather up any friends to play it. But oh this, yeah, this so looks like a blast. It's a lot of fun. Two button, very accessible. You just dive in. Anybody can play this thing. Like it's literally two buttons. This would work on an NES controller. <laughs> um, pick up bombs, throw them at people. Try not to be knocked off the ring. Think sumo wrestling with explosives. But it's cool because like the the motif, like you're on like a kitchen table. And this yeah, thing your is little happening. toys. Yeah. Like it's uh, the the Zach Pierce the. Uh, the developer, he, he says his inspiration was just knocking over toy towers when he was a kid. And that's, that's literally like what it is, right? It's those little wooden precious moments blocks that you're throwing around and knocking over. And it's so much fun, and it's, the explosions are so visceral. It's something you can pick up and play immediately. That's also a quarter one release of next year, also all major platform. Um, Starcrossed should be this year, all things considered. Uh, Two-player cooperative arcade shooter. Um, 
you ping pong a star back and forth between two magical cute girls from sort of magical girl manga inspiration. And uh, the star, you have to sort of work together by communicating to get that star to bounce between you and smack enemies. Uh, that guy also coming later this year. Uh, then we have two more that are a little bit longer. Uh, is IO Interloper, which was an IGF finalist this year. Um, it's a hacking game. Basically, the entire thing is a, a narrative-driven corporate espionage simulator where the game itself emulates a desktop environment, and you have to hack into computers around the world, sabotage drones and alarm systems, and steal stuff for people. And it's a whole lot of fun. It's a really heady, difficult kind of puzzle game. Um, and that guy's... I don't have a definite release date for that one yet for you, but it'll be a year. Um, and our last but not least is uh, Tinselfly, which is sort of a mist-like game. Um, this is one that's uh, near and dear to my heart because I'm always the guy jumping to defense of games people call like walking simulators. Like mm -hmm. I always hate that term. But like I've loved Firewatch and you know The Witness and these kinds of games. And this is definitely very much in that vein. Um, yeah, you're a, a, a young woman who has sort of a almost like a memory and personality problem dealing with the world. It's set in a science fantasy universe where it's sort of like 1920s, but in space. Um, it, it's really early in development, but you can take a look at some of the information on the site. That sucker will impress you, but it's going to be a while for us to get it out the door. It looks, it looks really, really nice. It's a wild kind of experience. So we showed off just the environments at Replay FX. So it's just a... Mm. There's no gameplay. It was just wander around the environments, interact with some of the interactables, take a look at this world we're creating. Um, yeah, I think that one has a really unique angle, and I think folks will really appreciate it. But it's gonna that one's gonna be a year or more, I'd say, before we actually get that guy out the door. That's awesome. So uh, you know, again, it, it, I thought it was kind of cool that that replay effects. We, we I think we talked about a little bit in advance of how that was a more laid back experience. It's not an E3 or something. Um, yeah. But I, I did notice, like, I came up and talked to our friend uh, James from uh, Mega Cat Studios, and you were chatting with him as well. Yeah. And uh, it, it was cool that you guys were on the same block there. It was that like a kind of a cool uh, uh, a developer, uh, you know, mini. Uh, uh, network event for you guys a little bit yeah so it's it's you know i think that's the plan with replay i don't have any insider information on this but i think they're trying to grow the indie space mm -hmm. um so that you know more indies in the pittsburgh area are represented because there's so many folks that are I, I mean that are all from this area and doing really interesting things i mean you know like even shell is pretty big but they're still kind of indie in their own way and mm -hmm. you know getting that collaboration is is important i think um, you know, Night in the Woods just came out and like absolutely crushed it at the IGF this year and the Game Developers Choice Awards. And they're at least some of them are Pittsburghers, too. So getting that collaboration piece, I think, is really important. So, yeah, it was kind of like soft networking for us. You know, normally when you go to E3, GDC, whatever, that's just like five to seven solid days of 5 a.m. till 3 a.m. hustle. Uh, and it's really tiring. You come back and you're in tears. But it, uh, this was definitely a lot more laid back. So I will say the hours are wild. We'd get there at like eight in the morning and leave at like two in the morning. It was just that was that was pretty wild. I I didn't even realize that. Yeah, I guess they do start that early. I think I did do some early console. Uh, yeah, I think they I think they open the doors at nine. But like it takes us a while to you know when you're demoing five games, there's a lot of tech you got to get up and running and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we'd get there about eight eight thirty, and yeah, we'd leave just shortly before one or two when they close. Blah. That's awesome. Uh, well, it was great to check out uh, some of your games there uh, in person and online and everything. And it's cool to see this is happening in Erie. Where can people find out what's going on with you guys and keep updated on you? Uh, you can always check out whitethorngames.com. Um, we've got a mailing list, too, just whitethorngames.com slash mailing dash list. I'll throw a link up. Um, but basically, the mailing list is a once-monthly thing called the White Paper, which is a bad pun. Everything we do is a bad pun. Uh, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. You can follow us at Whitethorn Games on Twitter and pretty much everywhere else. And I, I do see there is a submit your game, so you are o o openly, you know, if you have a game, yeah, we, I presume we if have you're a, in the Erie area. Yeah, you actually for publishing, you don't even have to be in the Erie area. Uh, I mean, you can be anywhere on this planet um, for our publishing activities. If you want to sit in our incubator, it certainly helps if you're in the Erie area. <laughs> um, makes it very difficult. Uh, but no, publishing stuff is all fiber op video con. If you need us, we're there instantly wherever you are on the planet, even if it's on your phone at a shelf. So, uh, 
yeah, that, that piece, we're actively soliciting for 2019. Um, so anybody that we get into the sort of backlog right now, it's probably a half dozen in there right now. As of 2019, when we start getting some of these guys out the door, um, we really can only have five that we're actively working on at any given time until I start banking a lot more cash and can hire up. Uh, but mm-hmm. at the moment, 2019 backlog solicitations are definitely actively open. If you have something interesting that you think might be worth us uh, talking about, you can absolutely fill up a form on the site and someone will get in touch with you. There you go. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, again, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Matthew White up there in Erie, Pennsylvania. Glory, beautiful Erie, Pennsylvania. You got Presque Isle, you got everything up there. It's great. I can't complain, man. I got waterfronts, <laughs> I got fishing, I got lots of land. You got Waldemir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a grand old time. That's great. Uh, so awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Please check them out. Again, whitehorndigital.com. And we'll be keeping an eye on them as well and sharing whatever we see uh, come out from you guys when any of these titles come out and release. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to share them over on our Awesome Cast social media on Facebook, on Twitter. And of course, over at awesomecast.com is the home base for us. Thank you so much uh, for this. And, and again, if anybody out there has anybody in the video game, again, these are like these, these little like pockets of secret awesomeness that are happening here even just in western pennsylvania or wherever if there's anybody you think we should be chatting with on this show that's doing awesome things in video games technology uh or or whatnot uh please let us know hit us up uh on our social media and any of those links over there uh thank you to our awesome guests you've been our awesome audience please have an awesome week This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.